We are now live and recording. Welcome everyone. We will wait a few moments to make sure that everyone has a chance to arrive and check their settings before we begin today's presentation. Uh, in the meantime, I'll go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, closed captions are available. If you'd like to be able to read the text, just go to the bottom of your screen and click the CC closed captions button. Also, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the program, so feel free to post your questions in the chat and we'll answer them uh, as many as we can towards the end. Okay, that's it for the housekeeping. We are ready to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Preservation Snapshots Lecture. My name is Kendra Parson, and I am Advocacy Manager for Landmarks Illinois. Thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome to any of you who may be joining us for the first time. If you're not familiar with Landmarks Illinois, we are a statewide historic preservation nonprofit founded in 1971 to help people save places that are important to them and their communities. Our advocacy team works on 150 to 200 projects at any given time all across the state. And since our founding in 1971, we've helped to save almost 24,000 places. We are glad that you joined us today to learn about some of our important ongoing work. You can visit our website at landmarks.org to see all that Landmarks Illinois has done and is doing to help people save places for people. You can also visit our YouTube channel to see other great presentations and projects that Landmarks Illinois is involved in. Before starting our program, I'd like to thank our dedicated and generous members and supporters. Our impact in communities across the state is a direct result of your contributions to Landmarks Illinois. That includes our generous preservation snapshot sponsors, CNH Specialty Craftworks, JAQ Corp and Vinci Ham Architects. Their support ensures that we can host this series for you on a regular basis. Another special thank you to our annual corporate sponsors. We have a remarkable number of companies who support our work here at Landmarks Illinois. If you or your company is interested in supporting our work, we would be very happy to speak with you. Uh, you can reach out to Tiffany Williams, our Director of Corporate Giving and Events. Again, thank you very much to our generous sponsors. Another thank you to all the members of Landmarks Illinois who are joining us today. Membership support is essential to our success in advocacy, education, and programs. If you're not currently a member, I hope you'll consider joining today at landmarks.org. Before we jump in, as a reminder, if you need closed captioning, just go to the bottom of your screen and click the CC button. We are recording this presentation and it will be uploaded and available on our YouTube channel. Today's lecture is about Dr. Percy Julian and his family's home in Oak Park. Dr. Percy Julian was a chemist and entrepreneur. His groundbreaking work synthesizing medicinal properties from plants benefits millions of people to this day. In 1950, Julian moved his family to Oak Park. Today, the family's home at 515 Northeast Avenue is a contributing building within the local and national register listed Frank Lloyd Wright Prairie School of Architecture Historic District. This historic district recognizes and protects primarily residential architecture associated with the Prairie School design style pioneered by Frank Lloyd Wright. Although the Julian home is part of this historic district, it is not specifically recognized for its association with Dr. Percy Julian or the Julian family. As part of her vision for the future of her home, Faith Julian, Percy Julian's daughter, would like to have it individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places based on Percy Julian's historic accomplishments in science and also the accomplishments of his wife, Anna Julian, the first Black woman to hold a PhD in sociology. Today's lecture will share the history of the Julian family and their connection to Oak Park. It will also highlight Faith Julian's current hopes and challenges for preserving her home, as well as what you can do to help. I will now turn it over to our programs manager, Layla Wills, and Oak Park Library's special collections manager, Kathleen Spale, for the presentation.
Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kendra, so much. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. I, I would like to welcome and thank Kathleen Spale from the Oak Park Library for joining us. She is their manager of, and curator of special collections. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, Layla. Thank you so much for having me here today. Yeah, thanks so much for all the work you're doing to help Faith Julian um, help to, uh, you know, save the home and bringing her resources. Yes, no, we're happy to do so and really excited about today's presentation. Before we get started, we're going to hear a little bit from Faith because she couldn't join us today, right? Correct, it's due to some health issues, but as you know, we'll hear from her soon, so... Yeah, so we have a special message from Faith, and I want to tell everyone if there are any issues with any playbacks of audio or video, we will, this uh, presentation will live on Landmarks Illinois YouTube, YouTube channel, and we'll go in and make sure that we replace those um, if there's any lag or, or problem. Okay, so let's get started. Let's hear a message from Faith and then a couple of more clips from Dr. Julian and I will see you on the other side, Kathleen. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't be there today in person. Certainly, I extend my gratitude to Kathleen Spale, Layla Wills, and Kendra Parzon for making this program possible. Additionally, I want to thank all of you who are Zooming in or listening to this program. I truly appreciate your interest and support in keeping my parents' legacy alive. Also, I value your support in sharing my vision of having my home ultimately become a learning center for children as well as adults a learning center where they can learn about my dad, the scientist, and my mother, the sociologist. Both of my parents were humanitarians. I also envision the learning center as a place where children can learn how to be humanitarians, how to give back to the world of which they are a part. Throughout my childhood, I spent several months each year in Phoenix, Arizona, where my parents had a home. I would accompany my dad, who would go twice a week to the Native American reservation to teach the Native American children how to fly a kite. Kindness, good deeds, empathy, and love are virtues that are sorely needed today more than ever and should be instilled in children as our country presently faces division, hatred, and bigotry. Again, thank you so very much for attending this program. They very graciously made me Chicago one of the year uh, for some of my little work on cortisone, the cortisone family of drugs. <laughs> my uh, daughter, Faith, said uh, she was a little girl at that time just a little girl and she said daddy what is cortisone really and i said well faith and strictly speaking uh it's four pregnant three eleven twenty trion seventeen twenty one thio twenty one acetate she said heaven is daddy what is it not strictly speaking <laughs>
Great. Kathleen, were you able to hear that video okay? Yes, I, I definitely okay. was. Okay, wonderful. So before you get started, uh, we, we want to talk to you about um, Dr. Percy Julian's history and his wife, Dr. Anna Julian. But first, I want us to hear from him about some of the barriers that he had to overcome. Okay, uh, Frank, go right ahead to the next slide. Thank you. We are branded unfit to spend our money for lodging, food, or drink in public places, along with other Americans. This was in, late, in the late 1930s. And it was this year that I slept in my car 32 times, some of it in the dead of the winter, and I shall tell you in a moment about that. I did this in the states of Illinois, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Michigan on my trips for the Glidden Company. This was a speech that I rendered in the year 1937. And I had, I suppose I was a little bitter because on my trips for the Glidden Company, I'd slept in my car 32 times that year because in Illinois, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Michigan, where most of the paper companies were located, and these I was, was visiting, no inn would take me in. I kept the engine going many a cold night, and I said nothing to the Glidden Company about it. Why? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you, members of my race, why I did I did it for you. Because I knew that when you came along, if this continued, and if they knew about it, they would say, look at the trouble we had with Julian. We can't hire him. We can't hire this young fellow. We had so much trouble with Julian, we just, he couldn't get places to stay. We can't give him this job. And I kept my mouth shut. Said not a mumbling word to the authorities about it. I had many moments, as you know, of fear and anxiety because I, I didn't want it to become known, the secret that I kept. Kathleen, any comments on that? Um, Overall, it's just so inspiring um, to hear so much of what he had to overcome in his life. And, you know, in this clip, he was talking about the Glidden Company, but throughout Dr. Percy Julian's entire life, he had to overcome so many barriers to just become a chemist and let alone achieve everything he did, as we saw in the video. So. So I wanted to talk about if can we go to the previous slide again for a moment or with that? Okay. No, sure. Okay. okay. So I wanted to talk about Dr. Percy Julian, even before that clip of him growing up and some of the barriers he had to overcome. Even looking at the photos, you can see how much just that he had to face dealing with the school and being different. So Dr. Percy Julian was born in Montgomery, Alabama on April 11th, 1899. His parents at that time weren't even able to have a college education given to them. So it was their dream that their children would get the further education that they themselves were denied. So basically when Dr. Percy Julian, when he finished with eighth grade, he wasn't even given the opportunity to go to high school. So he had to attend a local teacher training school instead of attending high school. And as in the photos that you see there, even beyond that, most colleges and universities were not an opportunity for him. So he eventually went to DePaul University, which is a liberal arts college in Greencastle, Indiana. And looking at most of the photos, even those audio clips, Layla knows that, that they come from the archive that they have there that is focused on Dr. Percy Julian. And even after getting into Tabaw University, basically he had more barriers. They wouldn't even let him stay on the dorms on campus like the white students who were attending there. And basically he ended up having to make a deal with this Sigma Chi fraternity where he had to do chores for them and assist them just to have a place where he could live on campus. 
And in addition to all of this, once again, it makes his achievements all the more extraordinary. He had to take high school classes while he was taking his college courses just to catch up, unlike the other students who had the four years of high school. And even more amazing is by the time he graduated, so taking these courses, living with the fraternity, he graduated as valedictorian of his class, so the top of his class. So once again, it's pretty extraordinary, just let alone the achievements he had, as we saw in the video, let alone what it took just to even get to that point. But even after he got at the top of his class, you think, oh, you know, maybe some of the barriers were fewer. And so when he pursued further education, he, his professor, William Blanchard, even received letters from so many colleges and universities saying, please discourage your bright student because he's not going to be able to get a job after he graduates. And if like most of the students, when he would become a teacher, they said white students wouldn't want to learn from Julian. But despite all of this, Julian, as throughout most of his life, he was determined. He wouldn't give up. His family, his parents who had the dream for him to continue with education. So he did go on to Harvard University where he got a master's degree. And even when he couldn't find any college or university in the United States to give him a doctorate in chemistry, he went to the University of Vienna in Austria. And this is where, and it was very fitting that he attended the school, the natural products chemistry, because that would become the basis of so many of the accomplishments we saw, just like the tulips at the beginning, his love of plants and his work with plants to synthesize so many of these important medical treatments that we'll talk about a little more. Uh, Kathleen, before you yeah. go- Yeah, I was going to say Layla, yeah. Yeah, I just want to go back to um, when he, he tells a story on when he was in school and, and, and with his um, white counterparts and his other, her, other students, and so he, he tells a story where they're all receiving letters, like his professor is sending out, let, their professor is sending out letters to get them further in their education. And so uh, Percy Julian tells a story where, where he's, he's afraid to say anything, to say, well, I haven't got my letter yet and what's going on. But he finally does approach his professor and said, you know, did you send out any letters for me? And he, and he said, I knew you were gonna ask me that. And then he shows him a letter and where it says, uh, you know, even if we took this guy in, he's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to get him a job after he graduates. And you need to encourage him to just go on to teach when he gets finished. And that's the path that he did at, at first. So he went ahead and, and started teaching at Howard University, I believe for two years, and then said, you know, no, no way, I'm not staying here. And and then I, I think that's when he went on to Harvard or Austria at that uh, time. Harvard, but yeah, I did want right. to say that in his, this story, he says how that's what they would do to uh, Negro students. They would just get them through their education and then send them off to teach. Yes. Oh, thank you, Layla. Yeah, absolutely. He talked time and again, just like the clip, how he had to deal with so many other barriers and not be treated on the equal plane, even as he's valedictorian of his class and the top student of his class. And this professor's recognized his talent and skill. Even in Vienna, one of his professors, you know, said he had no other student ever the likes of him before. He was so talented. So... And he became fluent in uh, German while he was over there. <laughs> yes. Yes. He had many different talents in addition to science. I know that's something Faith Julian also talked about. Um, so I was going to talk about then some of his specific, you know, we covered it very briefly in the video, but I wanted to go just a little more in depth. So if we can go forward a couple of slides to the achievement. Yes. Yeah, so that slide. Okay, so as you can see there, it lists them there. 
But Julian's first and one of his most well-known achievements was a synthesis of physostigmine. And why is this so important? As in the video, this became very essential in the treatment of glaucoma. And once again, why Dr. Percy Julian's legacy is so essential. I mean, even to this day, people's lives are being impacted and changed and helped because of the research he did. And so even in 1999, the American Chemical Society recognized this, synth this synthesis as one of the top 25 achievements in the history of American chemistry. And I believe at DePauw, they even have a honored plaque, you know, talking about that achievement. And I just want to tell people that when we're saying DePauw, it's not DePaul yeah. University, <laughs> it's DePauw with the W at the end in, in yes. Indiana. Yes, Green <laughs> Castle, ahead. Indiana. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very good point, Layla. Um, and then even after he did this great achievement, so one of the greatest achievements in the history of American chemistry, like he talked about with Glidden, and that's why I found the clip so powerful, he basically couldn't find a job. And every single place was telling him the same thing. Even with DuPont, his colleague and friend got a job. He was interviewed and they then sent him an apology saying, oh, we're sorry, we didn't know what race you were when we called you in. And so you can, you know, under, well, I mean, with the clip, understand why that he was so worried that when Glidden eventually gave him the job, that they were one of the few who actually were able to give him a job. So... So basically, um, from there, he also oh, had, what? Yes. Yeah, before we go past the yes. Glidden company. Yes. So, you know, the clip that we just heard about how um, he had to sleep in his car and right. he kept this right. secret. Then he goes on to say that even though he was going to keep this secret, it turned out um, he couldn't keep it a secret anymore. So he, so the Glidden company asked him to come down from Chicago for, for some event that they were having. And he was traveling with one of the executives from the company. So during the day, they would go over to the plant and, you know, do, do what all these things, inspecting equipment and, and other things. And then they were both going to stay at the same hotel. And so the first night they got there, they checked in, with no problem. And so, so he was like very relieved, but he was very nervous when it was time to check in. The next morning he said they went and had breakfast, no issue there either. They go to the plant and then they come back that eat the, the executive says, well, let's not go drive back tonight. Let's just stay one more night. And so he said, oh, Julian, you better not press your luck. This is him saying this to himself. And they get to the desk and he says, oh, it's the same clerk. So he thought he would not have a problem. And the clerk told him he had to check out. He had to check out right in front of the, the executive. And um, and he asked, why did I have, why did he have to check out? And he said he heard a why that he never heard before, which was when you came down for breakfast, the lights were kind of low. So we thought you were East Indian. But then we found out during the day that you were a Negro and we don't accept Negroes. And so the executive at the Glidden Company. He's Julian Percy uh, Julian said that his mouth was just hanging open and he just could not believe what he was witnessing. It never occurred to, the, to him that this was happening. And then that's how they became aware of what he had been going through during his employment. Oh, thank you, Layla. Yeah. And that seemed to happen time and again, like you said, literally, he's next to somebody else who's having a completely different experience than he himself, even though they're equals in every other way. So, yeah. Okay. But uh, so continuing, but it once again, at the Glidden Company, that still was amazing that they had the job. He was a director of research of the entire laboratory in Chicago. So even with what he was dealing with, he accomplished so much there. And even with his team and, and made millions of dollars for the company, um, he especially focused on the soybean um, during that time there. But it was also there that one of his other great accomplishments was synthesizing progesterone. 
And so in addition to, you know, Glidden with the paint company and other products that he also was, he kept returning time and again, because Dr. Percy Julian meant so much to work on these health and medical treatments because he knew it changed lives and also to mass produce them so that many people would have access and it would be less expensive. So it was more than just the actual scientific achievements to him, it's also the difference that it made. And he did that over and over. Uh, so similarly, um, from his soybean work at Glidden, the protein that he isolated became the main ingredient of bean soup, like we saw in the video, or the firefighting foam, which once again credited in saving thousands of service members' lives during World War II. So once again, not just the achievements itself, but how it impacted and once again continues to impact people's lives. That's so extraordinary. Yeah, and that was another thing. See, when things happen, all of us have different, um, like you said, experiences and perspectives. So there was some kind of spill somewhere of a whole bunch of soybean oil. And but his eyes seeing this, you know, it, it, the way it hit his brain was he came up with this uh, fire retardant foam. Right. just like a fluke like he didn't set out to do that but that's the way that hit him when they had that spill but I'll let you continue and um so that we can get to Dr. Anna uh Julian also yes and I was just going to finish up really quickly with the achievements is also with cortisone similarly like with the progesterone once again making it more mass produced widely available in a simpler way and obviously that to this day is still so important, especially with arthritis. So yes, let's go on to- Okay, the and then one last thing on that. Yes. See, it's not you that I'm rushing, it's really me. But <laughs> so then when he started to synthesize the hormones, mm -hmm. I believe he, the first, I forgot the first pound, I think they he said they sold it for like $70,000. Something's wrong with that, what I just said, but you get my point. And yes. then it started to be mass produced and then it only cost $40. So that's how important these, um, these discoveries and in what he was doing, these combinations were to regular people making it way more affordable. Yes. And similarly, they said with cortisone too, and we'll talk about later, like Forgotten Genius, the documentary, but it talks about that in there, that everybody wanted cortisone when Mayo Clinic showed what it could do and the impact it could have. And they literally didn't have enough. People were paying thousands of dollars at that time to even try to get access because who wouldn't want to be relieved from their pain? Um, and, and so, yeah, it was like you said, uh, Layla, just because of his achievements and other chemists that it was able to reach every, like today, how, you know, everybody has access to cortisone treatment. So that's what I was going to say. We still use it today. And another thing he and uh, Mrs. Julian were very active in civil rights and W.E.B. Du Bois, he was the editor of the crisis magazine, and they have a lot of correspondence between each other of him writing for the paper, discussing issues, the paper, the crisis magazine always highlighted him. They were uh, very active in, in the scene. It, you won't even hear a, hardly a speech by Dr. Julian without him addressing science and social issues going on. Yes. No, definitely. And he even received the Spingarn Medal from the NAACP, too, in 1947 for his achievements. Um, and that was an award that W.E.B. Du Bois also received. So, yeah. And definitely, if you hear the audio clips like Layla shared some of them, you definitely would hear that, especially from Du Bois archive. So I think we're ready to go on to Dr. Anna Julian. And especially for Faith Julian too, uh, she really wanted to make sure that while despite, or in addition to her father's achievements, her mother's achievements and her dedication to the community and giving back, like Layla said, being involved with civil rights, that she was a pioneer herself. We already mentioned the first black woman to earn a PhD in sociology. Um, like Dr. Percy Julian, she was born November 24th, 1901, like the turn of the century in Baltimore, Maryland. 
And like Dr. Percy Julian, she too had parents who really emphasized getting education. And she even lived with her aunt to attend the West Philadelphia High School for Girls before attending the University of Pennsylvania. And one thing Faith Julian really emphasized too is at this university, Dr. Anna Julian was a member of the Gamma chapter of Delta Sigma Theta, which was University of Pennsylvania's first black sorority that started in 1918. And Dr. Anna Julian became the fourth national president. So one of the first presidents of Delta Sigma Theta, which focuses on service. And Dr. Anna Julian was also treasurer and vice president of Lynx Incorporated, which is a national organization of professional black women devoted to civic, cultural and educational pursuits. And she also received the Rita Johnson Humanitarian Award and multiple honorary degrees. So it wasn't just Dr. Percy Julian who was receiving all of these awards. Um, Dr. Anna Julian as well. And you even see on the slide, you know, that she was vice president, treasurer, and bookkeeper of Julian Laboratory. So obviously, Dr. Percy Julian saw his wife's achievements that she was so integral to his company when he opened it. Uh, you know, trustee of the Erickson Institute and a board member of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. And for those in the Chicago area, that she was board president of Rosary College, which is now Dominican University and the Oak Park Education Foundation. So once and, again, so and Dr. Julian, he said uh, I, uh, in one of his speeches, I'm married to this little woman who's a hard, did she go to Harvard too? I believe he said she graduated from Harvard. No? I'm not sure. Yeah. I had okay. University yeah. Of Pennsylvania, but. Okay. Yeah. 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 And um, in um, her work in sociology um, is also, that's why she she's the first black woman to achieve it. She did like this study of a uh, hundred families on um, welfare and just she was a very insightful person herself. And I think the um, historical society in Oak Park and River Forest, they said something like if she if she wasn't married to Dr. Julian, like she would be like world renowned. Like now we know her primarily like um, his wife, Dr. Anna Julian, but she was a superstar and hero in her own right. Yes, yes. absolutely. So, so let's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go on to the next Yeah, slide. I was going to say, let's talk about the Julian family. There we go. Yes. Just and briefly, and then we're almost at the house because um, there's there this family has accomplished so much. It would just take us a long time to go through everything, and and I think we all understand how important they were to American history and scientific history, and saving people's lives, <clears throat> providing longevity in their lives with 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 the medicine, and we really want to get to the home that is in danger. Um, but go right ahead. That's Dr. Julian, Mrs. Julian, yes. Faith, and and her brother, uh, Percy Levon Julian Jr. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so this ties in perfectly actually to talking about the home, because in addition to all of their achievements, it what role does this play in Oak Park history and Oak Park civil rights history as well? So in this photo, they told us this was when they still lived in Maywood, but by the end of the 1940s, especially with the children, they were outgrowing that home and especially with him opening his own laboratories. So basically, they chose to buy a home in Oak Park, which we saw earlier that home and, and Kendra talked about as well. Unfortunately, just like through so much throughout the Julian's life, um, they faced discrimination even coming into Oak Park. So on Thanksgiving Eve of 1950, just as they were preparing to move in, there was an arsonist who tried to burn down their home because they didn't want them moving into Oak Park. And even a year later, it didn't even end after that, where Dr. Percy Julian and Dr. Anna Julian were just leaving town for a weekend. And Faith talks about this on her GoFundMe, and she was with her brother and someone threw dynamite at the house. And in both cases, obviously their attempts were unsuccessful, but you can see in addition to them living in the house, 
that basically they said they were not going to be intimidated by all of these attempts and threats and that everybody should have the right to live where they want to without fear. So they even hired guards to watch. Dr. Percy Julian was known to keep watch even late at night because even though it might've been safer or easier to move out of Oak Park, they chose to stay there and felt it was important to do so. So and both, both of both children, I believe, uh, throughout, they both went to school in, in Oak Park, and I believe they were the only black students throughout their entire school years throughout that entire time. And um, Dr. Julian also um, helped to integrate Appleton, Wisconsin. So Appleton, Wisconsin had a law, a statue on the books that no Negro could be housed overnight. And he was there with, with another business associate who, and he and Dr. Anna Julian stayed with this white uh, executive for two weeks, breaking that statute. And that person ended up getting sued and they won, he won the lawsuit and integrated Appleton, wow. Wisconsin also. So at the same time of uh, the Julian um, Laboratories, which was when, which was very financially lucrative too, Dr. Julian um, processed vitamin D in mass amounts too. And uh, so then, so with their success, which um, they moved to Oak Park and in Maywood, they had a street named after them. I, I need to go by there and get a picture of it. I, I think it's still, I think it's the Ju Julian Family Way, um, something like that. But we'll we'll get the um, somebody said we're we're gonna oh also come put your uh, questions and comments in the chat and there we we are getting to that point. But somebody just said where the arson is prosecute caught and prosecuted. I don't believe so. I don't think I, don't, I was going to say I don't think in either case they ever found who did it. You know, it was late at night and they came and went. So no, yeah, yeah, I never heard of. And that was the okay. same year too. And, and if I can just mention a few achievements in a short amount of time, because I know we want to get to the home, is that was the year when this uh, arson happened when he was named Chicagoan of the year. I mean, what a juxtaposition that he's named one of the best you know, citizens of Chicago. And here he is getting his house almost burned down just because they don't want him living there. But, you know, Kathleen, in Black history, a lot of what has happened, even when it came to Tulsa and other places, as people were making achievements, having their own businesses and everything else, those others would come in and destroy everything. Um, so I think part of the arson was because of the Chicagoan of the year and his international acclaim and, and his uh, success with Julian Laboratories and the fact that he could afford to move there. Like, I think all of that, it wasn't just because you're Black, it's because you're Black and, successful. you know, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you, Layla, for that. And I could totally see that. It's the way that yeah. people feel threatened they, that's, you know, they act out. Um, and, but I just wanted to list some of the other achievements really briefly, even though there's so many, uh, but Faith really wanted us to mention, um, and for everybody here to know, in 1975, Percy L. Julian High School was opened on the south side of Chicago as a Chicago public high school. In 1980, the Science and Mathematics Building on the DePaul University campus was rededicated as Percy L. Julian Mathematics and Science Center. And then in Oak Park, even in addition to the bus that we saw during the video that honored him in 1985, Hawthorne School in Oak Park was renamed Percy Julian Middle School. So now we can, you know, go on to the next slide. Yeah, and uh, the the school at DePaul University, Dr. Julian actually had something to do with um, they there's a picture of him in their archives of him looking at the design and all of the other faculty members talking about this new school. So he had something to do with that before it was even built. Yeah. yeah. And so just so everybody knows, uh, what we have here is Forgotten Genius. That's where a lot of this information from today, in addition to DePaul archives, is from 2007 um, from Nova and can be found online, even at the libraries. Might have DVD copies. I know a park library here has a copy, but I would highly recommend it. It's very well done. 
Yeah, it's on channel 11. And I would recommend any parent to have their, their young people watch. This is super inspiring. Uh, I was telling Faith last night, I was like, after listening to all of his not all of them, but a lot of his um, talks and things. I feel like, hey, I know, I know Dr. Julian, or he was one of my my professors, or or mm -hmm. something. But um, he's very encouraging to young people. He really was, um, and for for them to enter into the scientific world, and it was a, it, it is a very good documentary. You can find it on PBS. It's on the website. Like it's a, it's totally available for you to watch. And they have teacher's guides as well with it. Because like you said, yes. that was a big role. So many of his chemists that worked with him and his lab were so impacted by his life too. And he was very generous as a teacher. So Yeah. So let's get to the next slide. And we're coming to the Q&A um, in just a few minutes. Okay. We're, we're going to describe some of the issues that um, is going on with the home, um, that are going on with the home. And we're hoping that um, some of you may have some ideas suggestions. We'll tell you where, where things are now, but we hope our preservation community can help us um, with, with the Julian home. Yes. So basically, when it first came to our attention uh, and at the library and also in Oak Park, it was in September of 2021, uh, where Faith Julian herself came to the library. There was a Wednesday Journal article about it. You know, once again, her father's bus right outside the library, and here she is coming into the library to form this GoFundMe because she had many taxes to pay from multiple years on this house. And, and she talks about in the GoFundMe that, unfortunately, you know, just like talking today, she's been through so many different health issues over the previous few years. And so basically she was putting the request out here that there are problems with the home. There's repair issues that need to be done and we'll be sharing a little about it in addition to the taxes on the home. And you know, Faith has, she's still in the house today, like I said, when they chose to stay, like 70 years she has spent in this house and they also have multiple boxes of collections dr percy when we said the archive of dr percy julian at depa there's many more materials in this house let alone the home itself so you can see in these pictures she said a tree fell on the garage roof and you can see the hole within it and you can see on the front of the house some of the paint um, that needs to be worked on and so one of the things, you know, that we're looking to try to do and looking to all, any of you who are also on today's presentation is we've been talking about what are the best solutions along with Kendra, whether to form an or just to wait, let's go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to talk a little bit more um, uh, detail about the house. So it's in, in, as Kendra described, Oak Park's historic district. So, which is on the national register. So the home, so uh, it's not, um, uh, you know, listed under Dr. Julian and Dr. Anna uh, Julian. So that's one thing. So inside also, you can see the garage, um, has been is faith thinks it's um completely total so it, so she did have someone who like a contractor who volunteered and came out there but he volunteered and just gave her an estimate on how much everything will be would be and um at that time i believe the estimate was about three hundred thousand dollars inside and out she is uh her brother has gone on has passed away. Uh, Faith is the, is she's doing a heroic um, effort all by herself. So we just want to bring more resources and and uh, Kathleen and I our our knowledge is, is kind of limited. So right now. Should she start a 501? Um, you know, how can we? She has the personal GoFundMe to handle to try to raise money for the taxes. And as you'll hear, oh, let's um let's advance one more uh slide. I think we yes. we kind of get an idea. And then okay, go right ahead, Kathleen. I'll let you take this quote before we get to the next slide, and then we're going to open up the discussion. We're not done with the discussion, but we're going to open up the discussion. 
Yes. So if you look, and we're going to share about the, with the GoFundMe, what's the link to it, but this is one of the quotes that Faith had in there and, you know, evident throughout this entire presentation. She said, Dr. Percy Julie and her father gave so much to the world. And like she talked about in the beginning, please help to make the vision of their family home into something that will continue to give to the world. So Faith Julian once again said that a learning center that was throughout both he and Dr. Anna Julian's life consistently, what could they give back? And that's Faith's dream of what their home could become to continue that legacy. Okay, next slide. And let's hear a message from Faith, please. Although I haven't updated my GoFundMe since last year, it is still viable and active. Unfortunately, I've been ill and my health issues have caused the lapse in updating my GoFundMe. Hopefully I shall remedy this in the near future. GoFundMe only reports the amount that has been contributed and not the amount that has been spent. So although the GoFundMe is showing $38,988, I actually only have $2,000. The 2019 and 2020 taxes were paid, amounting to about $80,600. The 21, 2021 tax sale is coming up in February 2024. So my immediate need is to raise money for the 2021 taxes, which today amounts to $38,000. Any amount that you can give will be greatly appreciated. Again, thank you so very much for attending this program. Yeah, so the good news is that um, she has raised some some money, which which but we, we're going to keep going with the GoFundMe campaign. And Kathleen, I, I you and I both we help on in our um, spare time because we know how important uh, the this legacy and, and history, how much how important they both are. So that's what we want to do with uh, with others. And if you have any um, suggestions and other things, where uh, put your questions in the chat. In the chat, Frank is going to come on in a little bit and start giving us the questions. And you can ask Kathleen, uh, just or in just in general. And then when Faith sees this, you know, we'll and we'll have her answer it. Uh, Kendra's available for any technical questions. So please, Frank, go right ahead. I think we're still waiting for questions to come in. There's been a couple questions on question on the address, but it looks like it was answer there um 515 northeast avenue of park is that correct uh-huh yeah so that one okay i see someone so. who said i'm working with congressman davis senator lightford and other elected officials to raise funds and make this vision possible thank you thank you for that and um we will ask you too when it comes for the national register for letters of recommendation that we can include in her application for for landmarking still waiting for <laughs> other questions but um kathleen or layla do you um have any other comments well, I, I was just, oh, do you want to go first? Layla? No, no, go right ahead, Kathleen. No, I was just going to say, you know, like how Layla said, why well, involved, you know, like behind me right now, I'm in special collections and in the special collections at Oak Park Public Library, we have work from, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright and Ernest Hemingway, and they have their homes in Oak Park that have been become landmarks. So just like Faith, you know, talked about, that's a dream too, that Percy, Dr. Percy Julian should be among these other great noble, notable figures in Oak Park to have a learning center and a place dedicated to learning about him. Oh, and we have a lot of questions coming in. So. Yeah, uh, Mary Lou, I just want to say hello to um, Mary Lou. And if you have any um, ideas at all, uh, just feel free, let's talk about it. Um, it would be very good. The question here about, um... Are there grants to support this work, the Oak Park Foundation? 
Well, so for one thing, when it comes to grants, uh, so we're all in, in conversation. Grants are usually to 501s. And um, as of this moment, um, there's not a 501 established. However, that's another area of um, expertise and advice that faith kind of needs on how to how to move forward to attract and be able to obtain grants and funding like that. And if I could add, you know, we are very um, happy to have some of those conversations and, and help uh, guide Faith when she is ready to move in that direction. Um, so that's one area where we hope to um, be supportive of this vision. There was also a question about uh, Ms. Julian expressed uh, a desire to turn the house into a learning center open to the public. Uh, is that effort... Uh, getting any traction or what steps are being taken for that? Yeah, so, um, and Kathleen, I'll let you jump in I, because there was one other thing I forgot to mention, but it's kind of, um, we we can't get to that part. The concept and idea is being fleshed out, but um, there's some, some uh, you know, more urgent things at the moment. That's the ultimate vision. I also wanted to talk about Dr. Julian's archives and personal effects and, and other mementos and other things that um, Faith has. So it's a lot of history. We don't know if there's all his, you know, his chemical formulas, which I'm sure are available somewhere, but it's his own personal um, items and papers. And he has letters to W.E.B. Du Bois and other contemporaries of his time. Go right ahead, Kathleen. Did you want to add on to that at all? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, that pretty much, you know, covers it. Well, like I said earlier with the collections, yeah, it's amazing the amount of materials and original materials. And I'm sure it would be very important, especially working in a library, special collections. I can say once again, Hemingway, Frank Lloyd Wright, how many materials and students are still learning. So I can only imagine how his, you know, papers and original work would inspire continue to inspire, let alone the science community, whatever notes I know. There's we just a, had a little bit of feedback while while Kathleen was talking. So I'll mute next time um, we, in case that's from my end. Go uh, right ahead, friend. Yeah, thank you. There's a question here, I'll, I'll throw it to Kendra. Just can you clarify the, if, if the home, how the home is locally listed or designated? Yes, thank you, Frank. So yes, the, the house is part of the, um, as I mentioned, the Frank Lloyd Wright Prairie School of Architecture and Historic District that is both a national register and a local historic district in Oak Park. Um, so the house is a contributing resource, as we call it, to both of those districts. Um, and so it has currently has all of the, the benefits and protections that landmark designation offers um, however, that is uh, for its association with this broader historic district rather than for its specific association with the Julian family at this time. There's a question just uh, perhaps provide a little bit more detail on uh, the conversation around ownership of the house. So who currently owns the house and what's the plan for ownership in the future? Yeah, I won't go all the way into this over the, you know, without Faith being here to discuss this herself, but there is a trust set up. And someone I saw, uh, I can't just see the name, but he wants to have an offline discussion about some of these. And, and please, please do, please reach out. Our uh, contact information is on landmarks.org, uh, Kendra's and mine. So um, please do reach out and um, we would love to continue the conversation. Uh, there's also, okay. just to clarify, Faith is the current owner of the house, right? The yeah, the home is in a trust. So I don't have like the trust okay. papers or anything like that. So Faith, Faith would need to go into detail on that. Um, but she is the last um, child of the Julians alive. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and then uh, of the, the brainstorming of use that we mentioned, what one of the ones that, that uh, Faith has mentioned, is that use allowable in a residential district in Oak Park? Um, would it need to be part of a larger plan to, to have a like, public use like that in a residential neighborhood? Uh, Kendra or Kathleen? <laughs> sure, I can, I can uh, start to answer that. So um, yeah, so that this, is, this house, I believe, is currently zoned uh, residential single family. Um, and to be quite honest, we have not, we're, we're still at a nascent stage with, um, with Faith's vision. And so I don't know that that's something that's been fully explored yet. 
Um, however, there are, of course, uh, other homes of notable figures in this same historic district, the Frank Lloyd Wright Home and Studio, the Ernest Hemingway Home, um, that, that, have, uh, that were originally single family homes and, and now have other um, educational and museum uses. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that, that, thank you for that question. I think that does require some further exploration. Thank you for that. And there's a, there's a comment here just about um, that while we're like early in this, this what can happen to this place, that uh, they would be very interested in seeing a 501c3 nonprofit organization form uh, so that they could contribute to that um, versus a GoFundMe account. So just a hope that that opportunity becomes available. Yeah, we and we are aware of of that. Um, believe me. So Faith has been doing a heroic job all by herself, and um, and so we are. Kathleen and I are reaching out to others to to help in this effort. And I saw somebody talk about a cleanup day and and that kind of thing. So I don't know. I guess we would. Frank, what what do you think about something like that? I did. She thinks the garage is totally uh, is total. Like I don't know if a cleanup would help. Yeah, we certainly would want to um, uh, help help where we can and uh, uh, make sure we're in a safe environment too. If, if, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, whatever resources we can bring to bear to to help um, Ms. Julian uh, Landmark Illinois would be happy to have that conversation. And Any we other? do have friends at the DuSable Museum and uh, the Chicago History Museum. And um, so we are um, trying to make everyone aware of the this um, situation so that Dr. Julian's archives and everything would, that we don't lose them, the, meaning we, the public, you know, these are things that, that he has benefited the American people, you know, with, with his work. And there is someone on, there's a website called findagrave.com. And when you go and look at his headstone, what a person, she commented on there that his work gave her grandmother an, an additional decade of, of life. That's how important his work was. There's a note here too of, um, that, that both the, the house and the garage are contributing to the, the uh, Prairie School National Register District. So that, that is a clarification there. Um, we have other comments uh, supporting elevating this story, um, uh, but I, I don't see any additional questions in the chat. And just looking at the time, um, I think it's about time to, to pass it back to Kendra to close us out. Great. Um, well, um, thank you, Kathleen and Layla and all of you who tuned in uh, for your questions and comments. If we did not have time or to answer your question or respond to your comment and you'd like to discuss further, uh, as Layla said, please feel free to reach out to uh, Landmarks Illinois staff. We hope that you enjoyed today's preservation snapshots lecture on Dr. Percy Julian. His work in synth synthesizing compounds from plants has enabled treatments for glaucoma, fertility, arthritis, and many other common medical concerns. Uh, and as we said at the beginning of this lecture, continues to impact the lives of millions of people to this day. Before we go, I'd like to share some recent news and upcoming events from Landmarks Illinois. Last week, the Richard H. Treehouse Foundation announced a $1 million grant to Landmarks Illinois for our reinvestment program loan fund. This generous grant will transform our capacity to support community-led preservation projects. It is also one of the top five largest grants that the Treehouse Foundation has ever awarded, and it will help more people in Chicago shape the future of their neighborhoods. Once again, our heartfelt thanks to the Treehouse Foundation for the significant grant. Speaking of the Treehouse Foundation, the Landmarks Illinois Richard H. Treehouse Preservation Awards Ceremony will be held this year on Friday, October 27th. Each year, our preservation awards honor outstanding examples of historic preservation across Illinois. So please save the date to join us in person at the FNAM Center for an award ceremony and reception. We will announce the nine winners of this year's awards in early September. Stay tuned for more important announcements and events by joining our email list. Just go to landmarks.org to sign up and you'll always be up to date on the latest Landmarks Illinois news. 
If you'd like to support Landmarks Illinois, we are looking for members and donors to help us continue helping people to save places like the home of Dr. Percy Julian. If you'd like to sponsor the Snapshots lecture series or some of our other initiatives, we have opportunities, so please get in touch with us. Our staff's information is available at landmarks.org, and we are happy to speak to you about these opportunities. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Layla. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon.